It's probably fair to say, brothers and sisters, that when you approach three score and ten or go beyond it, as some of us in this room have, that the subject of resurrection takes upon itself a lot more relevance. Is that not true? And uh, many of us, of course, have also laid to rest some of our family and our faithful brothers and sisters, and we long to see them again. And that day, we know from the signs around us, as we shall see this evening again, is very near at hand. On the day of the resurrection, brothers and sisters, will be a glorious and wonderful time for all of us. So it behoves us to perhaps make some incremental improvements in our life. That's what this Bible school really is about. And I want to thank Brother Andrew profusely for introducing the first two and a half of my studies this morning. Uh, Because he spoke eloquently about what resurrection really should mean to us, the resurrection of Christ. What does it mean to us? What impact does it have on our lives? Or what impact has it had on our lives? And what more could it do? That's really essentially what I'm going to be aiming to achieve in the next two and a half days. The two and a half studies beyond that will deal with the actual resurrection itself. And we'll look at the scriptures that speak about the day of resurrection and what that will mean for those who sleep in the dust of the earth. But for the next two and a half days, brothers and sisters, it's really about you and me now. What does it mean? We read in Romans chapter 4, what a superb exposition that is in chapter 4 of the subject of imputed righteousness. We look to our father Abraham. But you notice how the apostle ends? We read those last few verses of Romans 4, verses 23 to 25. And he's talking here about Abraham and, and Abraham's seed. So it was not written for his, Abraham's sake alone, he says, that it was imputed to him. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And so straight away, brothers and sisters, we see the importance of resurrection to this subject, of the imputation of righteousness, who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. So the apostle is going to deal with two aspects of the sacrificial work of Christ here. We want to explore those two this morning. This word justification that you meet there at the end of verse 25 is the Greek word decase. And it comes from that Greek word that has to do with righteousness. But the lexicographers say it means acquittal. And they then extrapolate and say it's the act of God declaring men free from guilt and acceptable to him. And the, and the point of the Apostle is stressing, brothers and sisters, is that which he makes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. If Christ be not raised, ye are yet in your sins. So the resurrection of Christ is a critical element in the complete removal of sin. And we're going to follow that theme when we come to have a look at Leviticus chapter 16. Consistent with the patterns that were set on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, Paul is going to emphasise these two aspects of the sacrificial work of Christ. He was crucified or delivered for our sins, represented, of course, by that goat upon which the lot fell, that it might be sacrificed. And he was raised again for our justification, represented by a living goat, that was released into the wilderness to carry away the sins of the children of Israel. So those two things are going to be emphasised here when we go back to Leviticus 16. I believe Paul's mind, under inspiration, is back in the, in the 16th chapter of Leviticus. So, brothers and sisters, it's faith in the resurrection of Christ that's the critical element for the forgiveness of sin. So would you join me back in Leviticus 16? Let's just spend a little bit of time here following through this theme of the two aspects of the sacrificial work of Christ that are so important to us. Now as we're going to see, these two aspects are all part of the one offering. 
And that's clearly emphasised in Leviticus chapter 16. So here we are in Leviticus 16, and this is a summary of the content of that chapter. Now, if we were to deal with this verse by verse, we'd still be here at the end of the week, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to pick the parts we need in relation to the two goats. Now, you can see there the areas that are highlighted, verses 3 to 10, we have the outline of the whole ceremony, so the sacrifices to be made by the high priest, etc., are outlined in verses 3 to 10. And in verses 20 to 22, we have the sending away of the scapegoat, taken away by a so-called fit man. This is a very, very intriguing aspect of this subject. So I won't go through that chapter division there of Leviticus 16. It's pretty obvious to you on the screen. Let's just focus in on these two goats. So let's start at verse 5 of Leviticus 16. And he... The high priest shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So we've got two kids in the in the Hebrew. We've got two words there, and the RV, the other hand, simply translated quite correctly, he goats. Now these two represent one offering, one sin offering in order to foreshadow the work of Christ in his death and his resurrection, the two things Paul has made reference to in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Notice what it says there in verse 5, at the end of the verse. Two kids of the goats for a sin offering. It doesn't say sin offerings, does it? It says a sin offering. In other words, two goats actually represent one offering. So there's two aspects to the one offering. Follows, of course, in verse 5 by saying, and one ram for a burnt offering. So we've been told something very important here. The work of Christ is going to be foreshadowed in these two goats, but of course it's a shadow. It's not perfect in every sense. As the antitype, the fulfilment will be, but it sets forth the principles involved in that one great offering that he made for the redemption of mankind. Let's just work our way down. Verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his boy of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And then he comes to the goats. In verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now notice this. He's going to set them, present them. He sets them before God. To illustrate, of course, the two actually represent one sacrifice, one offering. Let's move on. Verse 8. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now this casting lots, of course, is not some sort of you know, haphazard thing. Brother Andrew spoke of the death of Christ, was it? Was it murder, for example, as some of the clean flesh teachings and will tell you that it was actually a random murder? Well, it was it, brothers and sisters, and you know these passages, I'm going to quote them to you. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. You might, you might want to have a look at them, but just let's sit and listen. This is what the death of Christ was. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Peter says, Him, Christ, that is, being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, he had taken them by wicked hands and crucified. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 28, we read, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. It was, of course, the determination of the Almighty that his son should go to the death of the cross. So when we read here about casting lots, it's not just something that falls out. It was a predetermination. It was, of course, like the lot. The lot is cast into the lap, says the proverb, and the outcome is of Yahweh. It was by divine appointment that he would die in that way. One lot for the Lord, that is, as a sacrifice to be offered up. So here in Leviticus 16, we've got these two gates. We've got the one upon whom the lot falls that's going to die to represent the sacrifice of Christ. Now the other one, 
is called a scapegoat. See there at the end of verse 8? And the other lot for the scapegoat, Azazel in the Hebrew. And Strong is quite literal in his meaning. He gives goat of departure. Brown guy the Greeks based on Eusinius say entire removal, which again is quite important. Entire removal, a scapegoat, a goat of departure. And he's going to carry the sins and iniquities of Israel away forevermore. So the scapegoat plays a very important part in the ritual of the Day of Atonement. Now, there was no fuller day. There was no more important day in the entire religious year of Israel than the Day of Atonement. I personally believe, brothers and sisters, there'll be no more important day for those who sleep in the dust of the earth. I think they'll be raised on what will be a Day of Atonement. normally happens around the end of September, early October, which is why I often visit the grave of my mother around that time, just to see if there's been some disturbance there in the earth. I believe that's probably what is going to happen. I'll give you the proof of that later on when we get to our third study, God willing. So here we've got the scapegoat who prefigures the resurrected Christ through whom our sins can be removed far from us. Do I need to quote these passages to you? Do you recall Psalm 103, verse 12? Yahweh has not dealt with us according to our sins, that he's removed our sins far from us as the east is from the west. We read that. We know it to be true, brothers and sisters. What about Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 22? You know what that says? It says, In the day of judgment, that a man who has turned and changed his way, turned to righteousness, his sins, like those of David, remember, couldn't be forgiven under the law. His sins will not be mentioned to him. And so when David sits before his angel brothers and sisters, one of the great things will be that not a single word will be spoken to David about his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Not one word! But it will remain in the Bible forever. Think about that. Everybody who lives in the kingdom age will know the story of David and his sin with Bathsheba. But nothing will be mentioned to him. That's how far his sin to remove from him. And so, brothers and sisters, this is what the Apostle is getting at in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. These two wonderful aspects. So let's read on in the verse 9. Leviticus 16, verse 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So here we've got this this first necessity without the shedding of blood says the apostle in Hebrews 9.22 there is no remission of sins so the son of God had to die to declare on that cross the righteousness of God in requiring the death of all the sons of Adam, of Adam. all sons of Adam will die and as he said himself when the time of baptism came suffer it to be so now that we declare the righteousness of God he knew he had to die in Adam so this first goat is sacrificed so we read on into verse 10 but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness so here we've got the scapegoat being presented alive after his brother, as, as it were, after the other goat was sacrificed. Now this little phrase here, presented alive, two Hebrew words, emad k, literally means to stand alive. And the picture I get, brothers and sisters, is of the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. 40 days after his crucifixion. Can you imagine that scene? Father and son, united now forever. Was there an embrace? I don't know. I think there would have been. But standing in the very presence of his father, 
That's what this prefigured here. This, this goat that is presented to stand alive before Yahweh. Of course, it's pointing, isn't it? It's pointing to the fact of his perfect obedience. Now, I want you to come, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9. Again, another amazing exposition by the Apostle of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're familiar with verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats. Isn't that interesting? That should be goats first. We've just been looking at goats, the two goats in Leviticus 16. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, meaning, of course, the most holy place, as the high priest would do on that day, having obtained eternal redemption. We know that the words for us are not in the text. We know that the verb that's used here is in the middle voice. The middle voice has to do with something you do to or for yourself. It's telling us very, very plainly, brothers and sisters, that our Lord Jesus Christ who came, that we might be redeemed, that we might be forgiven our sins. That was his work. That was the reason he was raised up, that our nature was the first beneficiary of his own work. By his perfect obedience to his Father, to the death of the cross, the grave could not hold him. The righteousness of God required him to be raised from the dead and to be changed. He was the first beneficiary of the work he came to do for us. And he was presented alive forevermore. So have a look at verse 24 of, Romans, uh, of Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Brothers and sisters, there he is standing alive, as it were, in the presence of God, that our sins might be completely removed as far as the east is from the west. Now back in the Leviticus 16, you might have noticed that it said, there, in verse 10, to make an atonement with him. Just one little Hebrew word translated with him. And that word is al, al, al. And al, al means simply over or above. Literally, it's over him. So here we've got the scapegoat who typified the means of atonement or covering. Here, brothers and sisters, is the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only in death, but in resurrection. Let's uh, come across to Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 20. <coughs> Here we come to that section which deals with what they did with the scapegoat. In verse 20 of Leviticus 16. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the order... He shall bring the live goat. Now notice what's been said here. This chapter is absolutely full of things that had to be done on this day of atonement, primarily by the high priest. He was the principal operator on this day. And everything had to be in place before they did this, before they released the scapegoat. Everything had to be done. What is it pointing to? Well, it was only when all the requirements to make atonement. Now, this word that we read here, reconciling in verse 20 of Leviticus 16, is the same word rendered atonement in verse 16 and verse 18. So it's about making an atonement. So here we've got all requirements to make atonement. Then they could release the scapegoat. And so it was in the antitype, wasn't it? Christ did everything required of him. A life of perfect obedience. A life totally given to the will of God. A life offered up willingly and freely to obey his Father to the death of the cross. Everything was done that was required. And when three days had transpired, the scapegoat, as it were, could be released. It was a resurrection. The life 
that we might be completely re- removed of all the iniquities and transgressions that would prevent our entry into the kingdom of God. So we read then in this 20th verse that he shall bring the live goat. That word bring there has the idea of bringing near, approaching, to enter into, to draw near. And it pointed to the resurrection of Christ, to eternal life, that he might enter into the presence of his Father. Read on into verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Now there's something interesting here. Did you notice what it said? It says Aaron shall lay both his hands. Well, you know, under the law, you go back to Leviticus chapter 1, when you brought along a burnt offering, you lay, the offerer would lay one hand, his hand, upon the head of the burnt offering. Why did he do that? Well, because it was identification. You identified with the offering that was about to be sacrificed. But what about putting both hands, brothers and sisters? What do you think that might indicate? And who's doing this, by the way? Well, it's Aaron, the high priest, the representative of the law. Now, I think this is, this is actually brought up to us by the apostle in Hebrews chapter 9. I think if you read verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 9, you get, you get a bit of a clue. This is full identification. We've got Aaron, the high priest under the law, and what is happening, what he's doing, brothers and sisters, is pointing in tight to the, to the work of the greater high priest to come. A work in which we are involved as Gentiles in the flesh once. So read verse 15. Now I'm going to actually read down from verse 12 to 15. Let's just get the, the flow of this. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's where this is heading, isn't it? This is where this is heading. Now study, we're going to see what impact the resurrection of Christ must have upon our life. Then it says this in verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death, so there's our first go, for the redemption of transgressions that were under the first covenant, the Mosaic, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So you've got the two aspects being emphasised here. You notice what it's telling us in verse 15? What it's actually saying, brothers and sisters, is that all of the faithful who lived under the law of Moses, and there were millions of them, for centuries, all of the faithful who went and made their sacrifices and saw in that sacrifice they were making a foreshadowing of the work of Christ, just like Abraham did in Genesis 22, those sacrifices that were made could only, of course, become the means whereby they might be forgiven permanently when the sacrifice of Christ had been made. So there was a redemption of all of those faithful sacrifices made in the past in the work of this man. That's why I think there's both hands here. It's got to do with the law. It's got to do with the things beyond the law. So Aaron puts both hands on this scapegoat. And he confesses over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Now, iniquities under the law, or in our case, as, as Paul puts it in Romans 2, we who were without law were embraced in the work of Christ. His death, that is, the first goat, covered sin, and his resurrection, the scapegoat, removed it permanently. Come to verse 21 of Leviticus chapter 16. We 
you've read, of course, that verse. But the words I want to emphasise are those at the end. It says, He shall send him away, that is the scapegoat, by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Now this word in the Hebrew, <coughs> iti, which you can see on the screen behind me, only occurs once. And here it is in this passage. It means timely or ready. And Rotherham, in his literal translation, says a man appointed. The RV has a man that is in readiness. And it's too difficult to see what this is pointing to because this was the only task on the Day of Atonement that was not performed by the high priest. The only task not performed by the high priest was given to this fit man to take the scapegoat out into the wilderness. Of course, it's teaching something, isn't it? The law could never take away sins. Only a man appointed and ready to offer himself without blemish to God could accomplish the desired outcome, the removal of sin forever. That's the point that's being made here. Now, I think you're familiar with Luke chapter 4. You know the record of Luke chapter 4, brothers and sisters, where the Lord gets up in the synagogue of, of Nazareth and gives his discourse based upon Isaiah chapter 61, which makes reference to the Day of Atonement. You're familiar with that? And you know what they tried to do to him in Luke chapter 4, this is 28 through 30. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Any of you here been to the what they call the, um, what's it called, the Mount of, uh, in, near Nazareth, have you been there? We were there 12 months ago. It's quite a steep cliff, if it happens to be there. Precipitation. Yeah, Mount Precipice or something like that. Um, if it happens to be the place, it's straight down. Right? And so they took him to, to something like that and they were going to throw him off. They didn't realise what they were doing. I mean, we know that they didn't believe that Jesus was the anti trivial scapegoat. If they had believed that, they wouldn't have done this. So, so the, here is something that's quite fascinating, that in their ignorance, they unwittingly followed their father's practice of old. And we know what that practice was. Edishon tells us about it in the temple. Page 319. Because the Jews were fearful that the scapegoat would return back to the camp of Israel, bringing back with him all their transgressions that were put on his head, to be taken away, they had an idea. And the idea was that they'd get this fit man to go out with the goat and find a cliff and turn the goat back towards the camp. Because you see, they, had, they pushed him over backwards. He, the man would push him over backwards. It'd be pretty hard to get a goat, wouldn't it, to go over forwards, over a cliff. So you turn him around so he couldn't see him where well, you're going to push him. And you push him. He's looking back at the king. And he dies. The whole point of the exercise was blown to smithereens. And here we've got Christ's own townspeople who hear the voice of one who's talking about the Day of Atonement in Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue. And they endeavour to throw him over the cliff. But there's divine intervention, isn't there? He passes through. Just as there was to be divine intervention to bring him forth from the grave. So with that as a background, brothers and sisters, to Romans chapter 4, let's just go back to Romans 4 and 5, 5 in particular, to see how the Apostle spells this out for us. Let's see where he goes from pretty clear reference to the Day of Atonement. It's 
So what we have, following the, the reference in verse 25 of chapter 4 to Christ being delivered for our offences and raised again for our justification, is really forcing home the importance of resurrection of Christ in relation to the forgiveness of sin. Now, the Apostle goes on in verse 1 of chapter 5. He says, Therefore, being declared righteous by faith, that of having righteousness imputed to us because of our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes into talk about the, the benefits that flow from being in that position. But when he comes to verse 6, he's going to go back and emphasise some of the things that we've been speaking about. For when we were yet without strength, he says in verse 6, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So what we have here in, this, in the chart that's behind me is an endeavour to, to try and set out what the Apostle is doing here. On the one side we have reference to the strengthless, which is what these words in verse 6 indicate, strengthless, ungodly sinners who are under wrath. So if you read down, all of those things will become evident from verses 6 through 11 of Romans chapter 5. Strengthless, ungodly sinners under wrath. On the other side of the equation, we have reference to the work of the fit man. And the words that jump out of the page at you uh, this little phrase, much more. See there in verse 9? Much more then. See in verse 10, the middle of the verse? Much more being reconciled. So you've got these two aspects again being emphasised. So in verse 6, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We read in verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now, there have been cases in history where people have put their hand up and said, well, look, take me and let him go. But you see, none of us, brothers and sisters, none of us before we came into Christ could have been described as good or righteous. We were enemies. That's the point the Apostle makes here. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us much more then being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life a reference back to Romans 4.25 raised again for our justification for the complete removal of sin and Paul goes on to say in verse 11 and not only so but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the reconciliation that word of course is not perfectly translated in the King James it means reconciliation We've received the reconciliation. We're reconciled to God through his work. Cause to rejoice, as he says in verse 11. So you've got these strengthless, ungodly sinners under wrath whose situation is completely changed by their faith in the effectiveness of the work of our God in Christ. Their belief in his resurrection from the dead. And it has to have an impact upon their lives. What I'm going to do now, brothers and sisters, is show you six slides, which are portions of an address given by Brother John Carter in America in 1952. I'm doing this for two reasons, a couple of reasons. One of them is, of course, is that he's going to lead us to the next section of our, of our study. He's going to summarise what we've been talking about and lead us to the next section of our study. Now, the second reason is that I can't do any better job than him. So I'm going to let him do my job for me. I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. Now, remember that what you're going to see on the screen is actually a part of a, of a talk. It's extemporaneous. He wasn't using notes. He was just speaking as if we were off the cut. So that's why it may not necessarily sound like a book. 
This is what he said about identification with Christ. And upon that basis of the reasserted supremacy of God, God invites men and women to receive of his mercy the forgiveness of sins if they will identify themselves with Jesus and make him their representative in what he did when he went to the cross. And so in our baptism, which is a symbolic death, we are baptised with Christ into death. We are buried with him. And so in that way we identify ourselves with him. And God recognises our acknowledgement in Christ Jesus of the supremacy of God's will as the rule of life. And God has said that we, that we who cannot do anything ourselves to provide the basis for the forgiveness of sins forgives us for Christ's sake. So it's a wonderful expression of the principles that arise out of what we've been considering and where that's going to take us in relation to the effect upon our lives. Under a heading raised for justification, he said this, and because he was sinless, God has raised him from the dead and made him the saviour. Because it's only half of the story to say that he was delivered for our offences. The other half is he was raised again for our justification. And his resurrection is the consequence of his perfectly obedient life. For if disobedience has brought death, then obedience is the way in which life can be brought. So, where does this take us? Well, he goes on. He speaks of the motive power for righteousness. And here we find the resolution of the other problem. Now, the other problem he's referring to here is the fact that we become steeped in sin. You practice sin often enough, it becomes part of you. It's a great difficulty to overcome. We understand this, brothers and sisters, by our own experience, our bitter experience, that if you, if you if you sin, and then you repeat that sin, and you go on repeating it, it becomes very difficult. It's really difficult to overthrow that problem. That's what he's talking about. Here we find the resolution of the other problem. If we confess our sins and obey God in repenting and coming to baptism, God forgives us our sins. But what about the trouble that sin has become ourselves? But grace reigns because in the death of Christ there is a motive power for righteousness. And Paul has expressed it beautifully, but very feelingly. I would like to go into this if time permitted, he said, when he says in his epistle to the Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. But he does go into it briefly. He says this, he recognised the need of being there on the cross with Christ, one with him. For if Christ died for all, says the apostle, then all died. And all must die in him to share in what he's done. And then you've got that quotation from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the power of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's going to be the core of what we're going to be talking about in the next day and a half or so, brothers and sisters. And then his fifth quote. A transforming power. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Reference, of course, the Apostles' writing. Because there was a transforming power, a constraining power in the love of Christ, which working in Paul gradually, notice this, I want you to be, note, take careful note of what he says, which working in Paul gradually, as Paul renewed his mind day by day by learning from the Word of God and applying it, gradually transform Paul as Paul says it must transform us it's a slow process brothers and sisters we know that by experience but there's got to be that constraining power that motivating power that moral force and that comes from our absolute conviction in the resurrected Christ is a reality this is his final quote that I want to put up, a lifelong process. For our service is a rational one. He's referring to Romans 12, which we'll come to in a second, says Paul. And that is a reasonable one, springing from the reason. 
And therefore our minds and our reasons must gradually and steadily be brought into conformity with God's will. It's a slow process. It's a life's process. It's never complete in anyone except in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I want you to come to Romans 12, brothers and sisters, because this is the passage he's got his, his, his mind upon when he's saying these things. And what we meet here in Romans 12 is one of the four places where the, the word normally translated, a couple of times translated, transfiguration, occurs. This word transfiguration, which of course is used in the transfiguration of Christ, is metamorphic. We get our English word metamorphosis from that, as we well know. It means to change the form or to transform. There are four occurrences of the word. Two of those, Matthew 17, two of Mark 9, two are a reference to the transfiguration of Christ. And the other two, we want to just focus on briefly at the end of this study. Romans 12, verse 2, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Okay, so the other two we're going to have a quick look at. In relation to this lifelong process of change through the transforming power of the resurrected cross. So let's just read Romans 12 verse 1. Uh, The other references we're going to have a look at is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, would you notice just one thing before we do that? Romans 12 verse 2, the use of this word metamorpho is actually about the transformation of the way we think about the renewal of the thinking process. Whereas in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's probably taking us just one step further. It's about the formation or the transformation of character by mirroring the character of Christ. So let's take this first one, Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? One dead goat, one living goat. Right, a living I mean that's a conundrum isn't it living sacrifice really it's a conundrum so you've got to put to death something in order to live really yes so the same principle crucified with Christ but living in the newness of life your, he says, your, that will make you acceptable unto God, that is fully agreeable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We know the word's logikos. We get our word logic from it. It means rational or intelligent. It's something that you come to the conclusion that this is the only way. This is the only real way. Then you go on to verse 2. And be not conformed to this age, now, the interesting thing about this verse for me is the use of the voice. We have in the English language, of course, the, the passive and the active voice. In the Greek, there's a middle voice. Now, passive is where someone does something to you. You're the receiver of someone else's actions. Active is where you're the doer of the action. Middle voice is where you do the action to or for yourself. So think about that when we come up with these verbs that are used here. Who makes the decision, brothers and sisters, to conform to this age? Who does that? We do. That's why the first verb here is in the middle of voice. We make the decision. Be not conformed to this age. But be transformed. Transformed, here's our word, metamorphic. Guess what voice that is? Passive voice. Are you transforming yourself? No. God is transforming you. He's the doer of the action. You're the receiver. What for? Transformed? What means? By the renewing of your mind. Renewing means renovation. You all know about renovations, don't we? Take down the old stuff that's falling apart. Put in something new. Goes on to say this, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It takes, it's taken me a long time, brothers and sisters, to agree that God's right in it. 
And by experience, we learn God's right. And you prove. That word prove there is in the active voice because it comes about from what we do in life. We learn, don't we, by bitter experience that God is always right. Our own ideas, our own way, will always lead to some kind of disaster. That's the point being made here. So come finally to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Here the Apostle, of course, is basing his words upon Exodus 34. When Moses spoke with the angel and he came out, he would speak with an unveiled face to the people, and then he would put the veil upon his face so that they did not see the receding glory. And the point of that is clear, wasn't it? God didn't want the people to think that the law was going to fade away. It was, it was, in, vogue, it was in vogue for the time. It had to, to live out its lifespan until Christ came along. He didn't want to see the people look at the glory of Moses fade and think, oh, what's that about? So he put a veil on his face. That's the context of this. So let's read verse 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed. Now there's our word, right? There's the word, metamorphic. So here we've got this phrase, beholding as in a glass. It's all one word in the Greek. simply means to mirror oneself. That is to see reflected. Now, probably in your room, when you go back, you go into the bathroom, you've got a mirror. What I see in the mirror, I don't really like that much. But if what you see in the mirror happens to be Jesus Christ, and you stare at him long enough, Changes will come. Little by little. Changes will come. That's what the Apostle's talking about here. So this word metamorpho is very, very important. It's in the passive voice, by the way, because it's God who's doing the transforming. We are the receivers of his action. It goes on to say this, doesn't it, in that verse. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we know what this glory referred to here is. Just cast your eyes across to chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 of chapter 4. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's about... God's character, which was reflected in Christ. And verse 7 goes on to say, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, which we're very familiar with, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's about God's character, fully manifested in Christ, manifested in part in us, brothers and sisters, but it's a process of a lifetime that's being spoken of here. Now here's a Diaglots translation of this verse. But we all beholding the glory of the Lord in a face unveiled, that is in the unveiled face of Christ, are transformed into the same likeness from glory to glory as from the Lord the Spirit. So it's God's power that's doing this. The RSV says, we are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. It's painstakingly slow if your experience is only like mine. Not true? painstakingly slow. But if you persist, if you keep your mind where it should be, brothers and sisters, as we shall reflect upon tomorrow morning, God willing, God works. He works to show your character to be like his own. It's from him, even as derived from the Lord, the Spirit. How important, brothers and sisters, is the resurrection of Christ? to those who believe as we do can't be any more important can it and we're going to see in our studies just what it should mean to us in our daily life